saying, what's he doing? Oh, that's So what are you using to um, stream with? Twitch. Twitch. Oh, okay. Because you can't do it on Google, because you need to have a thousand followers on Google. Really? Yep, to do it live. Um, uh, Mixer, I think, is and stopping it's probably going to get harder and harder. But <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Mixer is, I think, stopping you doing it now as well, because of what's happened in New Zealand. So who knows, this is going to become harder and harder to do. Okay. So and Periscope. Um, I've never tried Periscope, so I don't know. Um, the thing I like about this is that it streams it to Twitch and then saves it to Twitch. You can just export it straight out to YouTube, yeah. which is a nice way of doing it. For a couple of reasons. There might be people that can't come in the morning because they've got kids or drop-offs or whatever, yeah. and then maybe they want to watch it later on at night. And the fact that we don't get that many people anymore. Anyway, so. Perfect. Try, try and spread the love a bit more. So I think we might just start a little bit early, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, oh, that's so. That's the canary build. Yeah. I could do the canary. Yeah. 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 No, I spend most of my time in that. Yeah. It's always a bit risky doing the canary one, but once a month maybe it does something funny, which is about what the old age was doing for me anyway. So I don't really notice that much difference. Turning that one off, but for some reason to turn that one off means rebooting this one as well. Oh, okay. This is the worst AV system in the history. AV system. Alright. Do you need the introduction or can you introduce yourself? Uh you can introduce me and so if you if you want, I can I'll climb around have like 10, 15 early and then you can say whatever we've got left you can do your do your map with your prepared anything today. Okay. Uh, so it's a two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven people. Not too bad. Not too bad. And oh, Anthony. Oh, and Anthony. He's not people. Welcome. I was going to say ladies and gentlemen, but. <laughs> and gentlemen. Hi, Richard. <laughs> oh, sorry, I forgot the one in the corner there. Um, welcome once again to Brisbane is your DevOps user group. Um, good to see some new faces in here, but that's probably because of the topic that we're going to talk about, which is probably appeals to a certain age of individual. <laughs> so I don't see too many young people here. Saying, <laughs> We're all old? Is that what I'm trying to say? Well, old. We all have good taste. <laughs> or we could go with good taste, indeed. Yes. So Todd's going to give us a lovely presentation today on um, Azure DevOps with the Commodore 64, which I think is going to be quite interesting. We've got to be out of here by quarter two, because there's some meeting on afterwards. So I thought we might just start a little early. I'm not going to give my usual spiel of what's new in Azure DevOps. This month, um, uh, if you, I will put something up on our website that will summarise some of the stuff that's gone on. There's quite a few things that are coming as well. So, um, without any further ado, I'll present young Todd to give us an awesome chat. 
Thank you very much. All right, so, good morning. I've got two warnings. You guys are the first group I've presented this to, so it may go spectacularly wrong. Uh, so I welcome your feedback. Um, uh, the other one is there is a fair amount of nostalgia here, but looking around the room, I don't think I'll be alone, so that's okay. Um, as I was saying to some of the other guys, one of the, the very clever young people who works here with me at Microsoft pointed out they were younger than this computer. So, yeah, that didn't make me feel so good. <laughs> so, my, my name's Todd Whitehead. I'm a cloud solution architect uh, here at Microsoft. Um, I come from an app dev background, so I, I focus on Azure um, um, with, a, with a particular focus on, on application development. Um, and obviously, as people move to the cloud and do all this kind of stuff, the topics of DevOps comes up um, in different forms and in different guises. So, kind of, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Let's get this thing going. Okay. So, when I go around and talk to people, I show them slides like this. And Anthony may have seen this slide, I'm not sure. Um, so, you start off with that conversation, right, with people, what is DevOps? Because, you know, you get five people in a room, you get 27 opinions on what DevOps is. Um, you know, the people in this room obviously know this, this topic very well. Um, this, is, this is kind of the approach I take, the one from Donovan Brown, of course, because it does focus on the people, process, and products, because everyone tends to want to talk about the products in Azure DevOps or Jenkins or whatever it is, which are all absolutely essential. Um, but the people and process part is where things tend to go a bit wonky um, <coughs> to, to really unlock the value. Um, and I kind of tend to start to... You know, if people aren't are new to this field, you know, we, we talk about things like, you know, lower, lower failure change because there's often a resistance to do this stuff because, oh, we do it once a year and it breaks, so how can we do this once a day? And it's like, well, it breaks because you only do it once a year. You not see the logic. So we start to talk about this. You can see, I almost always see, you know, 80% of the people go, hey, yeah, this could work. And there's always one, one guy at the back of the room or one person in the back room, and I see a look come over their face, and I'm like, okay, it's you. Because there's always one who's got quite valid questions, and it's probably questions that a lot of people are thinking but don't want to answer. And that's, hang on, hang on. Todd, you're awesome. I'm sure that's wonderful everywhere else, but it won't work here. And they'll give you a whole lot of reasons why. Right? And depending on the person, they're either really articulate or really angry, um, or both. Um, and interestingly, when they, these sort of people give me these responses, I notice that they, the order is flipped. So they never start by saying, it's not going to work because of our people. It's not going to work because of our culture. They never say that. It, they almost always start with products and tools. It won't work because we've got some special thing. It won't work because our things weren't designed to work that way. All connectivity is another big one. That cloud stuff's great, but we're running on-prem, and it just, it just won't work. And I just kept seeing this time and time again. So I thought, it's got to be a way I can short circuit this conversation because this conversation can derail everything and take a long time when you get into the minutiae of what their environment is. So I started trying to think of something. What's something that the people are going to respond well to, right? Um, but will also help short circuit this. So I started to get a little nostalgic thinking about my childhood because probably like a, you know, a lot of people in the world, I spent a lot, of, a lot of my formative years, probably 10 of them, in the 80s. And I, I don't kind of mean these 80s. This wasn't me. This wasn't, you know, I wasn't a parachute silk wearing guy and I didn't, didn't pull off the mullet. I can't now and I probably couldn't have then. Um, I kind of think of, these, these were my 80s. These, they look like this, right? Um, you know, it was Matthew Broderick movies and it was, you know, people with computers in their bedroom saving the world. And it, admittedly, they were usually the one who put the world in jeopardy. Um, but that, that really wasn't a thing. And you also had to be careful, obviously, because you could get completely sucked into your computer and work out that, there's actually little people living in there. So that was the 80s I started to think. I said, okay, I'm sure I'm not alone there, so let's use that. Let's think of something we could do to have this DevOps conversation and show that 99.99% you know, of the time, there really isn't a, a tools reason not to do this. So for me, we kind of talked about this when I came in. For people who came up through this era, there was very different tribes. I was the Commodore tribe. Um, who he was a no, actually, there's always one. It's like the beta video guy, right? It wasn't always him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So who who was a who was a Commodore person? A 64 or a Vic 20, right? Who was Atari? <coughs> yeah, so you can stay. Uh, what else? Oh, we had Tandy, right? Because um, what was interesting about this period? Because there was there was a you know what 20, 30 kind of mainstream 
PCs of all sorts, and depending on where you lived, if you're in the UK, it might have been the, the Spectrum and all these kind of things. So there's a ton of these kind of technologies around. So I thought, okay, this will work. So started to think about it. I got myself a Commodore 64 on Evil Bay. There's plenty of them around. They go for a lot or a little bit of money, depending on how crazy the person is. So I got that. That's fine. Got, got the actual computer. The interesting thing when we talked about, you know, what computers you had, the, obviously people might remember this thing powered by a, the six, a version of the 6502 processor, okay? And so was almost everything else, right? If it wasn't powered by a Z80, it was, pro, it was powered by the same damn chip, yep. including things like the, the Commodore disk drive had its own CPU, its own memory, its own OS, which is like, we're slow, so slow. Even right through the, the Tamagotchi, so everyone remembers the Tamagotchi craze, right? The difference was, I guess, Commodore actually bought the company that made these chips so could customize anything. And if they had a bit of a software problem, they could actually run down the corridor and get people to make hardware changes to chips. So they had some, a little bit of an advantage there. So that was all fine. And if anyone watches Futurama, you might have noticed the vendor was apparently powered by the 6502. And if you paid close attention in the first Terminator movie, the T-800, that code is actually from the magazine to check the, the, um, the integrity of your text files and is also based on the 6502. So pretty much you can power anything. Uh, so if that, that certainly wasn't unique to the Commodore, but certainly growing up, one of the cool things about it, right, was the games. And as much as Commodore tried to promote it as an all-purpose machine and they had all these great ads of mum and dad coming home and doing the books on it, um, and certainly I remember buying a, a spreadsheet program on a cartridge for my mum and dad to do their stuff. Um, yeah, let's be honest, we live mainly in the games. Um, and the graphics were great, right, because, because of all the extra stuff they built around it, the hardware sprites and all that kind of good stuff. And as a kid, this was pretty amazing. Um, and that was good, but of course, the other big part of the Commodore 64 was the sound. Right? We've got to remember, this was an age when sound was mainly beeps some flat tones and things like that. Um, Another visitor. That's loud. Stay a while. Stay forever. Whereas the 64 was doing things like that and making sounds like that. So, pretty revolutionary. So I thought, okay, this can work. This has got enough hooks, I can use this. So, I bought this thing, it arrived, it had all the bits, and I couldn't do anything with it. Because I learned some important lessons. Firstly, the power supplies were built on the cheap, didn't have any protection, and after 40 years, if you plug it in, it's probably gonna blow up. Okay, no problem. So, this, I had to buy, go and buy another power supply. This is one built by a Commodore engineer, in, ex Commodore engineer in the US. Awesome guy. Okay, got that. Now I need to hook it to a screen. Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, it does have composite video output, but it only outputs at 50, 50 hertz. Nothing pretty much ever on this planet now will run that. That's okay. So we have to connect to HDMI upscaler to transfer that signal into something. So there was a lot of hardware problems, but we could solve those, right? Because let's face it, look what you can do now with how easy it is to source electronics, to design and build your own electronics, to print stuff. You know, it's the, the, uh, the world of today is that stuff is not really a legitimate problem. We can solve those kind of hardware problems. So I thought, right, what can we do? And the other thing I remembered when I thought back about it, apart from how great the games were and the sound were, was how damn long they took to load, mm -hmm. right? The 1541 drive had a bug in it since the Vic 20 days that they never bothered fixing, which made it so slow, which is why everyone had to buy all those aftermarket cartridges, which basically just skipped the ROM in the, in the disk drive. Um, but as a result of that, people used that time. So legitimate people like Ocean, became quite famous for the loading screens and the loading music they would show, um, and possibly less legitimate people um, who removed protection from games. I obviously never had any of those, but some, some people might have. They would use those to advertise and promote and bash. I thought, okay, let's build one of those using DevOps, because how hard can that possibly be? Sound like a good idea at the time. So really, if you haven't seen one of these or forget what they're like, there was really those kind of three elements. Obviously they had text and some, maybe some graphics on it, Colour was a big thing, right? So the, the weird sort of colour effects they could create on the 64. And then you had to have some cool pumping music. So, okay, no problem, let's do that. So then I had to, okay, now come back today, oh bugger, now we've got to actually do that. How do we do that? So you could code it on the Commodore 64, I had a look at that. I don't recommend even looking at that, your eyes will hurt. It's just very, very problematic. So I thought, okay, well, I've got a lot of cool tools already open to me. Obviously I've got Azure DevOps, I've got Visual Studio Code, surely this could possibly work. So in Visual Studio Code, one of its big things is, you know, any platform, any runtime, so okay, we'll solve it, done that. Um, but I did have the problem, I did need to assemble it, not compile it, because we're not going to write this in a high level language, we're going to have to write this in, in machine code. 
Okay? So hopefully Visual Studio Code can do with that. And believe it or not, there are quite a range of different um, <coughs> assemblers for the Commodore 64 actively maintained. Um, you can, this is one I picked. You can see the last update was in, uh, I'm guessing May. I'm trying to remember which cut. I think it's May. Let's assume this is the US date. Um, and not only was there one, there was actually a whole range. But this one seemed to be actively developed, so really good. So that's what we decided, uh, decided to do. So I found some code. I did some tutorials. Fired it up into VS Code, which of course is just a text file at this point, so it's all good. Uh, but it's not particularly exciting. You know, it's white text. Um, anyone's having a flashback back to write machine code. I never wrote machine code back in the day. I was, you know, I would write those three line basic programs when you walked into David Jones or Meyer and he'd, you know, it would print your name and you'd run out the door. Uh, so this was a whole new world. So that wasn't particularly exciting. But luckily, obviously, um, Visual Studio Code has a whole marketplace of extensions you can add on. I thought maybe I've got to write my own, but I just did a quick search and nope. Someone's actually, this great guy called Tony Lane, he's already written one. Because um, the other thing I didn't realize, of course, back in the day, Although the 6502 was the same across all those platforms, um, it, was, it only had the basic stuff. So people who built assemblers built all sorts of utilities and commands into the thing. Um, and so they're all different. So you can't necessarily just take a bit of code that was written on this assembler and get it to run unmodified on that assembler. So, okay, no worries. We've got a plugin extension. And once we whack that in, now we've got code complete. We've got syntax highlighted. We've got all that kind of good stuff that we want in the modern development environment. Super cool. Um, the other thing I did notice, there's no, obviously there's no concept of a project file or a solution file, so you have to explicitly, pardon me, include all your, all your source code. Cool. Now I need to be able to build it. All right, so I've got that Acme compiler, and I can run out to the command line, but no, no, surely Visual Studio Code can help me here. So Visual Studio Code, probably one of the most underused features I see is the, it's got the concept of tasks. So you can define your own build tasks. So, okay, we're going to come in there. Basically, I needed two. I needed one just to assemble it, just to assemble it and run it up in the emulator for me, because um, I'm going to use an emulator for my inner de development loop, because it's way quicker. Um, for reasons I'll talk about later, I also needed to add a compressed version, because <coughs> all of a sudden, two bytes versus a three byte or four byte starts to matter when you're trying to uh, distribute this. So that's the task I created, and creating those was pretty darn simple. Um, you create a uh, you know, VS Code folder, create a task.json file, and basically create a little set of parameters for what you want to do. In this case, I'm going to call the Acme compiler. Tell it what flavor, because the Acme compiler can compile to any, any of those long list of uh, platforms we saw, and compile my, compile my file, please. Cool. So now we could compile it and run it, uh, which kind of look like this. I'm experimenting with videos here because I know how long it takes to chop and change. So I just go up there, just go run, assembles, does all its magic, and then very hopefully. Okay, I'll come and show you that in a sec when I jump back to it. So the other thing to understand is where we're writing, because often, you know, when I talk, I go and talk about Azure and Sam and Eddie, and I talk about you know functions as a service, platform as a service, containers, infrastructure as a service. Uh, and I get really nervous when I get as low as infrastructure as a service, so VMs. Um, we're gonna go, we had to go a lot lower than that. So all that fancy stuff, well, even once you're on the VM, all that uh, runtime frameworks you've got, uh, the OS, common libraries, all that kind of stuff is gone. To write this stuff, we've got to be right down here. We're writing in machine code, but that each line in the machine code is basically one match, one to one with an instruction and instruction set. And not only that, we're gonna have to learn about gates and registers, because everything on the Commodore 64 is done by actually putting stuff into magic bits of memory. So let's have a look. <coughs> Looks like, yes. Oh, yes, we go sad. So we have to learn about things like this, because, of course, in a modern modern development environment, we don't even want to worry about what platform is running it. We just want to give it a bit of code. Back in this land, you know, things happen directly in memory. So we remember that 64K we had? We kind of don't really have 64K, because the, the 64 can address 64K of memory. But that 64K it has to address also includes, for example, anything that's sitting in the cartridge ROM. So if we plug our cartridge in, it needs a way to address things in there. Things like the basic and kernel ROMs are also in there. Right? So we're starting to shrink down the space we can use. Now what's interesting is this part, screen RAM. So the Commodore 64 screen is 40 columns, 25 rows. Each of those cells is a, is a byte in memory. So if we want to display something at a certain point in memory, we have to write it into the right memory location in here. 
And similarly, for some reason, way down here, is a matching block which tells that it, what colour to make that cell. So to do our text for our text loading, basically we're going to have to write something into memory here and put some colour stuff in here. Um, not only that, you have to tell it where in memory do you want your program to run. So it's very easy to go spectacularly wrong with this. Um, yeah, kind of interesting. <laughs> but luckily, I found some of the books I had in the 80s. And if anyone remembers the Osborne computer books, and luckily they published all of them for free as PDFs. They had amazing artwork and colours that never really matched what you did. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a string, which is a series of values. We're going to put it in a memory, uh, into a variable in RAM. Here it is here. These are all the letters. And then these little robot guys, apparently, are going to copy it over to the screen memory. But of course, you can't just write from one memory location to the other. That would be way too easy. We actually have to explicitly do everything. So there's some core registers here. And the one we're going to use here is this thing called the A, the accumulator. We have to take this bit of memory, put it into this register, then get this register and store it over to this memory location for each letter. That's all we've got to do, and the robots will take care of the rest. So what does that look like? Well, the good thing is, remember I mentioned those assemblers actually do their own, have some utilities to help you. One of the things they do is, it, if in the Acme one, it's got this one, which means rather than set each byte value into my variable, I can give it a string and it'll do that for me. So that's one less thing I've got to do. Um, just give it some string, it'll copy it in. So we've done that first part. Now, happy days. All we've got to do is loop through. So all we're going to do is load into the X register, one of those other things, our loop counter, load into the accumulator from that variable, that byte after that, and then store it into that location, which happens to be the a part on our screen memory. So what could be simple? And loop through and do that. And luckily for me, the Windows 10 calculator became my new best friend. Because not only can you do hex, decimal, and binary, um, you can add them together to the different formats. So I know, I can never, you know, I can't think hex, my brain doesn't work that way, but I know um, memory location 1024 is row one, column one. So I can go row one, column one. If I want to go to row two, I add 40, get to row two, and then I can convert that back to hex and just type that into my machine language. So, and if you really want to get down to it, as I said, so this uh, load accumulator, um, Mnemonic, this is to make it easier for humans to read, um, does actually map to a binary command which maps to the physical <coughs> signals on the board that um, to do that. Cool. So we do all that, that only took me a month, and you get this spectacular piece of text. It's a little underwhelming, okay? But it's a hello world example, right? So yes, that works, but it's not very, let's face it, it's not very 80s, right? Um, and you've got to remember, one of the big things in the 80s was colour. So at the time the 64 was around, it was all about CGA on the PC, which was the, you had a grand total of four colours in your palette. You could pick from the what, three or four palettes, I don't know. Um, or even the, you know, the app, some of the stuff on the Apple. Not a lot of colour. So the ability for the Commodore 64 to do stuff. So what, what we had to do was very simple. Just load in a whole range of colours. And what we're going to do is a colour wash effect. So kind of rotate some colours through and do it. So again, just create these which represent the different colours and it's similar kind of loop, a little more complex this time, but just rotate through that colour memory, stick them in there. So, let's see what that actually looks like. Can you play with that? And I think the easiest way would be to duplicate this, hopefully the uh, resolution will be okay. So here are in Visual Studio Code, we've got all that good stuff there. So if everything is working, we should be able to say, uh, run task. I'm going to do the compressed version because it's quicker. Okay, so it's going to do that. Now we're firing up the Vice emulator. We've got some color. It's better. <coughs> it's better. Still doesn't really have that IDs thing because that, that other thing is missing, right? The music thing. So we need to fix that. So what was cool about the music? There we go. So music on the 64 is provided by yet another cool chip, the SID chip. And the weird thing was it actually had less features in one sense than the VIC-20. Um, it, you, you had three voices you could simulate for different things at the same time. 
You could pick a grand total of four waveforms to make different notes and different sounds and a whole lot of parameters. What was interesting about 64 though was you could actually change those on the fly. And what happened was when it started out, people were just using it to make basic music the way they did. Um, but as they, as they kind of unlocked the power of this chip, they kind of figured out how to do stuff. So if you think of these lines as the three waves, um, these are the three what you'll notice is the waveforms changing dynamically within them and people got really good at this. This particular piece was written by a guy called uh, Rod Hubbard. You know, I think I'm always thinking of Rod Hubbard, but I'm not the center. But he wrote that in one night and it became quite popular. Um, interesting, when I was in the UK a few months ago, they in Hull, they had a live symphony orchestra replay all his music um, with the big screen at the background of the games playing. So watch this space, that's coming again and again. So okay, that's what we want to add to our program. How are we going to do that? Well, given how hard it was to get a bit of text on the screen, how hard do you think it's going to be to get the music on there? It's going to happen though. Funnily enough, that's it. Right? So a macro to load the SID file representing the music into a particular memory location, and then I jump to that music, that memory location. Who wants to guess how that works? The music, the music file that you need to write to do it contains both the data for the music and the assembly code to run that music. All right, so a separation of concerns, not a big thing in the 80s. All right, so the, the guys who wrote this had to be both musical and programmers to do it. So basically we're just gonna drop that, that SID file straight into memory and get it go. And it's going to run it. You notice I'm not playing, I'm actually jumping to a subroutine to play the music. So, what does that look like? Because we're nearly there now with the program. Oh, some of my is still running over there. So, this is effectively the finished version of our. Game loader, so now if I run this one up, run the task, press. So this, notice we've got 38k free of memory. Okay, now we've got, now we're back in here. So now we're working. Cool. Um, yeah, if you noticed on that screen that you had the 38k free of 64, that's not because we're using the RAM, it's because it's had to block off that address space to use for all those other things, ROMs and kernels, basic kernels and all those other things. Cool. Ooh, on the wrong screen. So, oh yeah, no, we're on the right screen. Okay, so, now we're gonna do that, dev now we've written our code, we can actually do that whole DevOps thing we're all here to learn about. So let's make some simple change. So here's our text strings here with the 40 characters. So Visual Studio Code doing all its normal thing, telling me I've got one uh, uh, one thing to do. I've got a spectacular comment, so it'll completely know what's going on. So it's now running up to Azure DevOps. It's going to do our Git commit. We're going to do all our normal good stuff. <coughs> so while that's doing it, that could be a problem. Let's test that. And this is also a problem when you're not when you're using proportional fonts. You've got to be exactly correct. Yeah. Uh, oops. Yeah. So anyway, um, they, they, if you are seeing this, and I, I do too. Know well spotted. See, this is why we pair program people. They do know and they give us mm -hmm. He's been waiting his whole life to have the right location to throw it out. Fix testers mistake. There we go. <laughs> So we've done our inner dev loop, we've got Visual Studio Code, we can assemble it, we can press it, and we can launch it with our emulator on the local machine. Awesome, so now we need to do that other part of the DevOps that's kind of important, right? So we've code commit to the repo, is no, it's Visual Studio Code, so no different than, than the rest of my cycle. So now we need to actually do a build. I 
Okay, so um, very disappointed when I win at Azure DevOps. It doesn't have a native Commodore 64 build agent. I mean, we've got Windows, we've got Linux, we've even got Macs. Before everyone leaves, we might start up a user voice thing. I'll get everyone to vote it up. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. We can we can overcome that. So, so we do have this thing though, right? This exact same thing we had Visual Share Code. We've got the marketplace in Azure DevOps. So, what are the odds there's a Commodore 64 one for? Well, <laughs> Mr. Landy again. Ignore this one for a sec. So he has one for the Acme cross compiler. I could not get this thing to work because that would have made my demo way easier. That's okay, that's okay. So I had to build my own, which is good because I learned how to build Visual Studio Azure DevOps extension, which I've not done before. Um, we are gonna use one of his though because once we do that, we also, I also wanted to create a, uh, a disk image which had it on it so people could download the disk and run that straight in their emulators. So we are gonna use his part of that. So who's written a visual, uh, an Azure DevOps extension? How'd it go? Bit of a loading curve? Yeah. Me too. <laughs> and not because it's particularly hard, it, it's, it's just a very different world, right? So it's based on TypeScript, so compiles into JavaScript. Um, but at its essence, it really comes down to just a few pieces. So we, the main thing is we have a manifest file which describes what this is, you know, what are the parts of it, what are all the, what are all the tags that go with it so you can discover it in the, in the marketplace, all that kind of stuff. Really? Really? Alright, that was not a scenario I planned on. <laughs> Why my PC reboots? Um, okay, while that's, re while that's doing that, let's change the order here. We have a camera. Who knew that? There we go. Okay. So my PC is having a moment. Let's pretend Todd is trustworthy and we have done the whole build and release pipeline. Oh, sorry, we've done the build pipeline. I'm going to come back and show you to prove I'm not lying. <coughs> let's, let's assume that's happened. At the end of that process, I've got uh, a simple program file and I mentioned the compression. Because now I've got to figure out how to get it back onto this thing. Um, uh, Tony Landy, who wrote those couple of extensions you did, I found some blog posts of his where he did this, but he deployed it to an emulator running in a browser in the cloud, which is nice. I kind of feel like that's cheating. Right? So hence we're going to go to the real one. So I thought about how do we distribute code back in the day, you know, back in proper, proper days. Right? Three ways leapt to mind in, in my head. One was you bought magazines. And those magazines had long, long code listings which you typed in and hope either you didn't make a typo or there isn't a typo in the code. Because let's face it, when you, um, even when you're doing basic um, on the 64, the version of basic here is basic is the right word, right? The, the, it's the same version of basic that was on the PET and the VIC-20. It doesn't know how to take advantage of any of the advanced stuff on the 64. So to do anything like that, you actually, the dreaded peaks and pokes. So you're actually gonna write into those same memory locations. So when you're reading through the code, if it says poke 1029, you've got to know what that memory location does to have any clue what that program's doing if there's a mistake in it. So that was one way, not a particularly nice way. Um, but the other way was things like this. So back in the day, even pre-internet, we had bulletin board systems. So I thought that makes sense. So I started to look at, surely bulletin boards don't exist. And if my people who was working, I could show you they do. Um, so they not only work, there's, there's networks and networks of these things. So what I've done is up in Azure, I'm running a VM, which has a copy of a bulletin board system, which is still in active development. And there's a whole range of them called Mystic BBS. Okay, it's running my bulletin board system. Well, it was half an hour ago when I checked, so let's hope it's still here. So we've got that, right? So now I've got my I've got my artifact in Azure DevOps. I somehow need to push it to that bulletin board system. Now, luckily for me, um, the people who've kept developing them have added lots and lots of protocols. So back in the day, the way it would work, obviously, is a bulletin board would call another bulletin board and exchange files using certain protocols. Now, that was not, <laughs> that's a little tricky these days. But luckily, they've kept them up to date, so they now have the kind of a hub and spoke model where it has the concept of having a hub BBS that you can telnet to or FTP to, 
or Big P, there's about 15 protocols these things support to transfer both files and messages. And then all the bulletin boards on that network will connect in and then download all the messages and all the, bullet, all the things for everyone on that whole network. Then it will do a processing stage where it works out what's for it and only import those because, you know, Scouts Honor will definitely do that. That's, that's how it works. Um, so that's what we use so, uh, here. So I've created a file area on my bulletin board to great, get my latest and greatest new program. Um, the Azure DevOps, luckily for me it had an FTP um, option, otherwise I would have to have written a, a protocol thing, but I would have written it exactly the same way as an extension. Um, so it publishes that to this bulletin board. Um, the bulletin board then runs a process to pick that up and run it. So hopefully by the time we get there, my new version will be up on this bulletin board. So now all we've got to do is get from here to the bulletin board. So how do we do that? Well, who remembers doing it back in the day? You would connect your phone line, you would start dialing, you would get connected, your mother in the kitchen would pick up the phone to ring your grandmother, and you, you know, there'd be a long conversation and hang up. Luckily, we're a little bit past that, so it's a bit hard to see if I can lift it up. Hanging off the back here in the user port, I've got a little gadget, again, which is basically the bottom half is a, it, from, from the 64's point of view, it sees an uh, haze compatible modem, right? So we talk to it. If I go to terminal mode, if anyone, this might cause flashbacks, warning. Um, you can do all the usual AT commands you would do, um, only this time you can see it's got some extra bits. It's actually on the Microsoft Guest Network. A uh, <laughs> little different to back in the day, but it is those same AT commands. That's all we're going to use to talk to this thing. At the top end, obviously, it then takes those and then sends, you know, uses the Wi-Fi to send those off. But now, rather than just dialing, you know, we, what would we type? You know, we type uh, attention modem, dial tone, and give it the phone number. We can now give it a URL. Go and do that. So let's give that a burl. So my bulletin board, which if my PC was working, I'd, oh, it's back. Um, we'll keep going now anyway. Um, uh, you can get to via a web browser. I'll show you how to do that. If you want to explore and join and become a member. Um, come on, we'll get five. So here's my slightly not populated one. So I have a bulletin board called retro bbs.retrodevops.com. Right? We can dial that. Wait, carrier. Fingers crossed, everyone's thinking positive thoughts. Hey! Didn't work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tester, what did I do wrong? Oh, there we go. Is it working? It was just slow. I'm sorry, it was 1984. I forgot. So, we're now connected, believe it or not, to Todd's awesome working bulletin board. Um, now, I had a problem here too because. In the retro world, and the retro world of bulletin boards, even this thing is retro. So all the bulletin boards are written assuming you can do 80 columns. <laughs> <laughs> I got 40. <laughs> now, in theory, this thing can do 80 columns. It shrinks everything and, and it, you can't read it. So I said, you know, luckily, I had to create a new theme, <coughs> the 40 column theme, which mostly works. Um, but there's parts of the bulletin board system I haven't yet figured out how to skim. Some parts are easy, some parts not so much. So this is the way bulletins work. You work. It's actually really hilarious if when you look if you your member sign up, comparing the member sign up form in here with what you get today on a website is absolutely worth reading. So it has things like all the usual stuff, and it has things like, how did you hear about us? You know, who do you know that's already on this bulletin board? Because this was like a not a secret society, but you know, this was a this is all based on trust and knowing people and all those kind of things. So I'm going to log on here. So you can go to this bulletin board later and create your own account. Um, and go crazy. It does ingest messages from that network of stuff. So it's all good. Oh, now I'm the SISOP. I always wanted to be a SISOP. Now that I've done it, I don't want to be a SISOP. Uh, so I'll get a few extra bits here, including this nice one. Uh, no, this one was my favorite. It's actually interesting because, of course, this is running on the Telnet. So as soon as you put anything with a Telnet server on the internet, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Luckily, someone's built into it's got pretty actually pretty sophisticated detection and will block IPs and do all kinds of different things. So yes, there's always a, there's always a hack attempt to work. Woo, main menu. All right. So to get this to work, I had to use I had to go back to the world of ANSI editors. And it remembers ANSI. So it's like painting but with text and it's unpleasant. But that's okay. We're going to go to the files area. Oh, that was the other interesting thing in here. I, I, I think I turned it off because I ran out of space for 40 columns. But things like how many times per day are you allowed to call? How many minutes are you allowed? Upload download ratios. All these kind of things which have disappeared from our kind of mindset now. 
but all there. So we've got, if we go and have a look at the areas, and this is where we'll start to hit some 40, 80 column weirdness, but you'll get the idea. So this uploads file area is mine. These other ones are coming from the network. So they're sharing files back and forth. Uh, well, actually all those last four are from that network. So we're gonna stick with uh, my uploads one. We're gonna list the files. See how easy this was? Um, okay, so there's one. Oh, that's one for you guys. Yeah, that's okay. How do we download it? Well, we can't yet. We've got to tell it we want to download it later. We go through, we hook up all the files we want to do. And then once we'll eventually get to a point where, okay, we can download that. Do you want to download it? Well, yeah, I just hit download, didn't I? Tell me how many are in the batch. Now we've got to pick our protocol because, you know, HTTP is so not there yet. Uh, I'm going to go Z modem. That's the one I definitely know. Do I want to disconnect after transfer? No, thanks. Do I want to start it? Yes. Now I've got to tell my terminal program, hey, something's coming. Tell that. And you can actually get to watch all the bytes come down. Uh, look at that. Isn't that nice? Wait for it. Wait for the, wait for the bytes received count to go up. Come on. You can do it. 1K. <laughs> yes. Now do you see why that compressed stage was so important? The uncompressed version of my Hello World program was 128K. It took a long time. The compressed version is 2K. Okay. Cool. Quit to main menu. Because, you know, it's just rude to do that other thing. And now we've got to say goodbye. Woo, we're off. So, in theory, if I do this, who remembers doing this? Remember I said basics, basic? There was no directory command. There was none of that. There was only three disk commands. Open, save, verify or something. Load, save, verify. Okay. And we do a list. Oh, now. Here's our directory list, and somewhere on here, we should see, yeah, there's C, what's it? C loader dash V73. Okay. That's, I should have picked a shorter name, shouldn't I? Uh, It's really confusing because keys are in completely the different places. <laughs> Asterisk gets its own key, equals gets its own key. Uh, yeah. And you know, two cursor keys because who the hell needs four cursor keys? <laughs> That's a little loud. Apart from the middle bit, we did it. We've gone from code to whatever, whatever, whatever. Let me see how we do for time now. Just let me jump back now that this thing seems to be working. Is anyone else appreciating the irony that we were just able to write assembly code, deploy to the cloud, take that deploy to a bulletin board and pull it down and run it on a real Commodore 64 and my modern PC crash? I'm glad I didn't write that. How many lines of code have long got? Well, this is true. This is true. Uh, okay. So we've done it all, you know, hey, we're being agile, that's okay. Okay, note to self, carry two laptops. Yeah. At least we don't get that nice fuzz now. Of course, yes, please recover that document. So that VMworld workstation will actually finally yeah, support Microsoft Hyper. Where did we get up to? We were uh, building yeah. extension. Yeah. So right now that's not possible. If you're running a VMware workstation and Hyper B is okay, cool. it just doesn't work. So how did we make that magic happen? Let's pretend I meant to do that. Uh, so obviously the, the bit we were missing was there was no way there was no tool installed. The, the Acme uh, compiler tool or assembler tool I had on my PC didn't exist in the Azure DevOps engine, so I needed to install it. Um, so this is the manifest file for that thing. Um, it's uh, just a JSON document, not that hard. Um, there is some categorization, because obviously in that same marketplace we have Azure DevOps extensions, we have Visual Studio Code extensions, all different sorts of things. So there's a whole lot of metadata, including is this public or, or private preview. Um, give it a few icons, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and that becomes important so that whatever you specify here is obviously what shows up here in the marketplace. And I've learned how bad I am at coming up with icons.
Crunzy. Amazing. Anyway, that's why I write code. Um, similarly, within an extension, you can have multiple tasks. So what I opted to do was really I ended up with four tasks. Uh, one to install the, the Acme assembler, one to install the Crunch utility, um, and then one to run both of those. I could have combined those into a couple, but I deliberately wanted to keep them separate so I could, and other people could use them separately. So in this case, as well as that, each within the extension, there's folders for each of these little these tasks, and they each have, again, their own manifest file, their own version, so they show up. I actually found some open source icons, so you didn't have to put up with my ones this time. Except for some reason, this one never shows up. I've got to figure that one out. That's OK. Um, now, the nice little UI you see in, when you drop these into a pipeline comes from within that file, you have these input fields defined. Uh, and there's a whole lot of UI elements, like pick lists, so the Acme compiler can actually compile this down for different platforms. So a raw 6502, a 6510, which is what the actual 64 has, and then some of the other weird variations. Um, but yeah, you can define these as a nice UI. And I found on the DevOps site, it actually has some UI guidelines about how to use these controls and what's the recommended way and things like that. So that's pretty easy to define. And that gives you things like this, right? So nice and easy. Uh, particularly having things like um, you know file browsers and uh, drop down lists instead of having to remember all these archaic kind of things. Pretty straightforward. The actual command itself, um, the SDK for building extensions, um, there's the main one for the task, but then there's also one for dealing with tools. Because I was thinking, okay, what have I got to do here? I wanna, I've got to download a file. I've got to, it's probably zip. I've got to unzip it. How am I going to, you know, I've obviously got to put it in some magic place to do it. But no, it turns out um, within these libraries, and in fact, I like highlight them, aren't I? Um, really, it was all the, most of this is just debugging code. Um, the actual important statement here, oh, sorry, this is to, to get the input, so get one of those values out of that drop down. Out. And what do you know, the library they give you has a thing to download a tool, you just give it a URL, it has a tool to extract it, and then it has a caching mechanism so that any other extensions in the pipeline can use it. So it was actually pretty, you know, incredibly straightforward. As I said, almost everything else is just me writing debug code so I can figure out if things went wrong. Um, in Visual Studio, I haven't yet created a task for it, but effectively the steps are for each of those tasks, you're going to run your TypeScript compiler to turn your TypeScript into JavaScript. Um, and then the TFX utility basically packages all those up into a VSIX, and you upload that, and away you go. Um, the one thing I did find, there can be a little bit of a lag here. I'm guessing it's cached it, so it can take one to five minutes for it to actually show up, the new version to show up in the build pipeline. Um, but all that info then, when you browse the marketplace now, you can get to see it, all the tags we kind of specified. And yeah, I'm definitely in the top two of extensions written for the Commodore 64, so that's a win. Um, and you can see I've also tagged what services that will work with. Um, so you could take this and run it on DevOps server if you needed to. <coughs> cool, so this is kind of what our pipeline ended up look like, which is you know, pretty much the same workflow we had on-prem. We install the, uh, the assembler, we install the compressor, we assemble the code, we compress the code. The extra steps down here are, we're gonna, I'm gonna create then a disk image using that Tony Landy um, extension. Yeah, yeah. Compress it, create a disk image with it on it, and then publish it like you normally would. You get a you know, normal sort of a, uh, pipeline. Um, you can do all the normal good things. Go into C, and you can go in and look at each step just to prove that I really am downloading it. I'm not lying. It actually does do it. Um, and then the same for the compression. You can see here all those things I put on the side just get passed in as parameters into the Acme thing, and it spits out its thing and does its thing. Oops. So we've kind of got to there. And this is kind of where we've jumped ahead, so here's the negative. Who remembers typing these in? Or if the publisher was really mean, they'd give you the assembly language version. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You yep. um, And these are the books I was talking about. These were the Osborne books. They were super awesome. You did, you know, my 10-year-old self could completely get that this dragon was definitely what this was, <laughs> but, you know, possibly now. And I did love the fact that these, these worked on, because they were, 6502 processors, and most of them had basically the same version of BASIC. Um, they could print this for four or five systems and just have these weird little archaic witch symbols that told you which line you had to change for which processor and all that kind of good thing. So this is what we did on the bulletin board. I'll just skip that one because we did that. So this is where we've got to. So this is my bulletin board. We're on this network called FSXNet, which is awesome, run out of New Zealand. It's designed as an experimental network because the other thing I found, people who still do this and have done this since the 80s, they're, they're a little precious, and if you don't know what you're doing and whatever, they get upset. So I think that's recognised. So this, this guy in New Zealand started this thing called FSXNet, 
which is an experimental network. So it's like, here's, here's some basic rules, go crazy, we're here to help you. Um, so we're on that. So basically all we do, we publish that in this case to my bulletin board. Um, my bulletin board, every half hour or so, will tell it to this bulletin board and say, hey, here's my new files or my new messages or whatever, and that will pass it down to all the other um, bulletin boards in the, in the network. Yes, this is kind of weird because we've kind of skipped this backwards. Um, obviously, so oh, the publishing stage, so this is the one bit we did meet. Again, for us it was easy because it was just basically an FTP step. I didn't have to write anything there. Um, one thing I did do, because you know, I'm a good person and everything, I didn't put my FTP passwords in here, obviously. I put them in Azure Key Vault and pull those out. You know, friends don't let friends put passwords in build pipelines. Um, and then FTP that up. Uh, do I actually don't show it there. Ah, the other thing I do do, so I actually have a, a UAD step, and what I'm actually doing there is copying that disk image up to Azure Blob Storage, and not quite ready, but nearly ready, will be a JavaScript based 64 emulator where you'll be able to go onto that page and you'll see in a drop down list all the files that are in that blob storage and you can just load them up and run them in your, your web browser. Package, key vault, very good. Uh, so, I guess coming, coming to the end of this slightly disordered session, but that's okay. So, we, we had our angry man. So, I would hope after that, you know, we've dealt with hardware things that don't work, we've dealt with software that isn't designed for this stuff, designed with PCs crashing. It's really hard to imagine software that can't be integrated into a DevOps pipeline. And we haven't even got to one of the biggest Swiss Army knives for this stuff, which is containers. Right? So in terms of dealing with weirdnesses of different platforms and remote disconnected scenarios, here we've used a bulletin board system. Imagine the same thing, but now it's fronting and maybe you're deploying use something like um, IoT Hub in, in uh, IoT Edge in Azure, right? So uh, there's a platform that's designed from the ground up to ship containers from the cloud. It's designed to deal with connectivity that's iffy or small or whatever. That's a whole platform that effectively can replace what we've done here with a with a bulletin board system. Um, and I've certainly abused that with customers um, like who are in remote uh, resources and mining areas. They only have sketchy connectivity or their connectivity is really good but heavily used so they only want to do things out of band and all those kind of things. We use Azure DevOps to push whatever their thing is down to containers um, and then from there it does whatever it needs to do internally to the network. So that same model works for, for a lot of things. So from a product's point of view, uh, I, yeah, you'd have to convince me really hard that's a problem. There will still be the 0.1%, I'll grant you that. Um, but that's fine. Even process is the next one that people give. And that's one I can happily argue. You know, you look at even in Azure DevOps, how easy it is to integrate with ServiceNow or any other web-based system. If they're using a, you know, uh, I've had people who use custom configuration management systems that needs to be reviewed and approved in a SQL database or an access database on-prem. Again, we can, no problem. <coughs> we can raise an event in Azure DevOps, push that down. Even through containers, I've had to do it through IoT Hub push down some code to some custom code on-prem that runs off to that SQL database or that access database and writes a line in it. You know, it's not pretty. <laughs> I'm not going to suggest you should do it that way, but absolutely it can be done that way. So ultimately the biggest problem comes down to people. Um, and, and that kind of takes a few forms in my head. Again, Todd's, this is Todd's opinion. Um, Anthony can throw things at me. Um, and this is where I think developers and people who are experienced in DevOps can really help because there's a whole lot of people now be they people from infrastructure or machine learning backgrounds or operations who have no background, have no muscle memory of things like code and source code repositories and build scripts. And now we're asking them in the cloud, guess what, everything's code. Your, you know, your configuration is code, your infrastructure is code, your compliance is code, right? And they don't have that, as a collectively, don't have tools and practices necessarily built around that. Um, so that's where people like developers or people who are experienced in devs can really help those people. And the other thing is just um, spaces where they're not used to working this way. And the, um, data scientists is the perfect example in my head, right? So many companies I go to and they've got these brilliant data scientists who train and build these models and then say to the, and in, you know, in Python or some framework they've used and go to the ops team, there you go. And the ops team says, I'm not touching that. I don't know what that is and it looks like it could hurt you. So building up that that tool set and that memory um, around those kind of newer types of um, development. Um, there's no reason that can't work for here, and I know Microsoft has published some really good guidance on how to do ML ops, because it's a fundamentally different model than 
checking in some code and building a pipeline. Uh, it's a different <coughs> cycle, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. <coughs> we made it. We got there in a slightly different order, and it didn't make quite as much sense, but that's okay. And we learned a variable less, proving once again the 80s rocked. Um, <laughs> completely, completely. I can't believe of all the connectivity, that was the thing that died on that. Mongrel. Um, awesome. So, that's it. I hope that was entertaining, if not <coughs> useful. Um, any questions? Otherwise, happy to call it done. Any questions? Thank you very, very much, Todd. That was My pleasure. I reckon that was really awesome. <laughs> really, 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 really Took me back to my childhood days mm. on, on Saturday after work, sitting there and typing. It's amazing things. when you hear that it, when you hear that sound, that eight bit sound. Oh yes. Ooh, yes. Comes flooding back for good or bad. No, that was really, really good. Thank you very, very oh, much. Mate. That was awesome. Well, thanks a lot guys. Um, we'll have another meeting next month. Thank you. Don't know who yet, but it could even be me. So <laughs> I expect five people to turn up. So that'll be good. Thanks a lot for coming guys. Thank you.